All right, we're streaming and we are recording. So without further ado, Sharon and Connor will bring you on to speak. Okay, welcome to the 2022 Virginia Congressional Candidate Forum Series on Developmental Disability Issues. We are happy to have candidates running from District 8 and District 11. These forums are designed for you from the comfort of your home. We want to thank the ARC of Northern Virginia, the Autism Society of Northern Virginia, Rev Up, Virginia, Resources for Independent Living, Billion Strong, and Dependence Center of Northern Virginia, Disability Resource Center, the ARC of Greater Prince William, Insight Inc., the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities Training Alumni Association, and special thanks to CRI for supplying the interpreters. Also, a thank you to each and every one of you watching live now or watching it taped at a later date. Now, I am proud to introduce my son, Connor, who will say a few words on the logistics and then the amazing Lucy B. Bell, who is our moderator for the 90 minutes. My name is Connor Cummings. I am a self-advocate and I'm proud to be autistic. Please remember that this is a sensory friendly forum. This is not a debate. Talk about what you can do and have done for individuals and families with disabilities of every single kind. Do, please do not speak bad about each other. Speak good about yourself and feel free to share your disability experiences and plans if elected. Please remember to concentrate only on you. Let the other candidates, for your own concern, let the other candidates concentrate on themselves while you talk all about you. And please, no speaking at the same time or interrupting each other. No raised voices whatsoever. Thank you very much for respecting the sensory friendly instructions. This is your opportunity to answer our questions and to hear our stories, not just today, but every day you are in office. To all of you watching out there, these candidates are here because they truly care. Thank you so much for being here to respectfully listen to all candidates. This is our opportunity to hear their disability platform, to help ensure that our representatives include us in their decision-making, not just mentioned, but the seat at the table. November 8th, or prior, you can vote for the candidates you feel is best for your needs and supports. Remember to always vote because our voice matters. You can get accommodations to vote if that helps you. I always have my mom with me when I vote. Reach out to Lucy if you have any questions or problems. Each and every one of our votes counts. Listen and pick the candidates that you think is best and vote for them. Now here is our friend Lucy to start with questions. Connor, I could never ask for a better introduction. Thank you so much for getting us queued up for tonight. For folks who haven't joined one of our forums in a while or who are new here, let's give a quick reminder about how the structure goes. We'll give each candidate a chance to answer every question. And they'll go in rotating order, so no one always has to answer first or last. First, we'll hear from candidates from the 8th District, including Representative Don Beyer, candidate Karina Lipsman, and candidate Teddy Fikre. Then we'll hear from the 11th District. Please note that Representative Jerry Connolly responded as soon as we had set the date for the forum, letting us know he sends his regrets and was not able to attend. He is sending a video message to be shared on our candidate events page at thearcofnova.org. But tonight we are so pleased to be joined by candidate Jim Miles, who's running to represent the 11th district. So we will still be hearing from folks serving that area. First, we'll start off by giving all the candidates a chance to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their background in disability services, professionally or personally. Then we'll move on to substantive questions. As we get close to the end of the time tonight, which we do intend to respect, we'll give all the candidates a chance to offer closing remarks. So make sure that you'll have a chance to hear from every candidate. We'll give everyone equal time as best we can. And we ask that candidates take about two to three minutes per question that they answer. 
though we will not be cutting anyone off. That's not sensory friendly. And Connor, we will follow the rules. There is no chatting going on during the forum tonight in the Zoom function. You can send a question in through the Q&A box if you didn't get a chance to submit your question in advance. Generally speaking, we get many more questions live than we're able to answer. So please note that we always send any unasked questions to every candidate after the fact. You won't be able to hear them answer them, but they will certainly know the stories behind your questions and the words that you wanted to share with them and what is on your mind tonight. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and turn things over to candidates for their opening remarks. And we'll go in the order that I gave when I just introduced the candidates by district. And then, as I said, we'll rotate one candidate down each time on who starts. So first, Representative Byer, if you could introduce yourself and give us a little bit of information about your background in the disability community. Thank you, Lucy, very much. And thanks for inviting me again to be part of this. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and I'm thrilled to be here with the other candidates. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm wearing a blue blazer and a blue cotton shirt. I've been a member of Congress for eight years, uh, representing Virginia's 8th District, which is Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and parts of Fairfax. Before that, I was involved in the family business for 46 years, um, selling cars. I started with my dad when there were eight of us, and uh, it's bigger now. <laughs> and um, I served as ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein for four years. I was Lieutenant Governor of Virginia for eight years. And I'm really proud to be here to, be, to talk about disability. It's very personal to me. Um, I'm the oldest of six, but my number two sister, uh, Kathy, was born with an intellectual disability, and we spent all 62 years of her life, um, you know, helping her live the fullest life she could. My oldest of four children has schizophrenia, been afflicted for the last bunch of years. Uh, my mother was president of the ARC of Northern Virginia. My sister, Kathy, whom I mentioned, was president of People First, so she was a, a ferocious self-advocate. I think the first nonprofit board I was ever on was in 1975, um, the Cerebral Palsy Center in Falls Church. In the 80s, I served on the Epilepsy Foundation National Board for many years. And then 1980, I was on the founding board of the Independent Center, which is committed to the idea that everyone with a disability wants to be as independent as they can possibly be. So when I was lieutenant governor, the first big initiative I had was creating um, the first ever Virginia Commission on Individuals with Disabilities. Uh, I chaired it for eight years, and it's now become a tradition of all lieutenant governors to chair it. Uh, the, there are many, many things we got accomplished, but the two lasting ones were the creation of disability service boards, like the community service boards that serve the mentally ill, the disability service boards serve those with physical and sensory disabilities and intellectual disabilities, and then the creation of, of paid attendance services. In Congress, the first bill I ever introduced was the Keeping All Students Safe Act, which bans the use of seclusion and inappropriate restraints in schools. It's been the number one issue for the Autism Society of America for years. And this is an issue that disproportionately affects kids of color and kids with disabilities. I'm happy to say that every Democrat on the Educational Labor Committee is a co-sponsor, including the chair. I'm on the Disability of Caucus, of course. <clears throat> I'll a few years ago, he introduced a bill to improve the reporting of hate crimes, which President Biden signed into law last year. And one of the categories of hate crimes is based on disability. According to the FBI, 130 hate crime incidents based on disability were reported in 2020. And we know that that's a dramatic uh, underestimate of those that are actually out there. Most recently introduced legislation, the Improving Diagnosis and Medicine Act, to improve the quality, appropriateness, and effectiveness of diagnosis in healthcare. Because we hear way too long about people waiting, way too long are getting the wrong diagnosis, which is only truer in marginalized community. My bill improves, aims to improve diagnosis so the complaints are not dismissed by physicians, but are actually heard. I also am leading the charge on long COVID to go the goal to create a patient registry, educate physicians so they can diagnose long COVID, and educate the public so they can know that they have long COVID. Long COVID is estimated to affect between two and seven million Americans. Senator Tim Kaine, who actually is affected by long COVID, um, has this also. This is just a quick snapshot of the work I'm doing, but um, for many, many reasons, but especially because of the family in, in which I grew up. Um, I've been very committed to making sure that we are 
conscientiously and compassionately addressing the needs of every American with a disability, trying to help them lead the fullest, most independent lives possible. I look forward to hearing from our fellow candidates and I'll yield back. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll have up next candidate Karina Lipsman, also campaigning to represent the 8th District. Karina, we would love to hear your introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Lucy. And thank you for having me here today. I would like to thank the ARC of Northern Virginia for hosting this forum. And I commend you for all the amazing advocacy and work that you all do. Lucy, thank you for spending time with me and educating me on the issues. Thank you to Sharon and Connor for your friendship and welcoming me into your lives so I can better understand how I can advocate for the disability community. And thank you to the representatives for being here today and Don Bayer for your public service. My name is Karina Lipsman and I'm the only Ukrainian born refugee immigrant running for Congress in the country. So when I first came to this country, I did not speak English and I felt disadvantaged in school. I felt disadvantaged in the community and I felt disadvantaged in my day-to-day -day life. However, I knew that this disadvantage was temporary. And as I have engaged in the permanently dis disabled community, experiencing firsthand the struggles with family members, with close friends and their children, I hear stories of hope, optimism, and sadly frustration. I have heard that it often feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel and that the system is broken that even for the most savvy, experienced, and financially well-off, the system is complex, complicated, and extremely difficult to navigate. And in many instances, it's not just a broken system, but our political leaders who would rather focus on high-profile issues or simply throw money at a problem, to try to fix it, and that is not legislating. That is failing to govern. So I'd like to share a personal story one of my close friend and someone who happens to be on my staff, Landon. She has a wonderful child whose name is Nick. Nick was born in 1998 and was diagnosed with autism in 2000. That diagnosis represented the end of the dream that Landon had for him, that all parents have. Which preschool will he go to? Will he be a baseball player? Will he attend UVA? Will he be a doctor? There is no roadmap for this diagnosis. Parents are grieving the life that they had imagined and simultaneously thrust into the dumpster of fire of special needs bureaucracy, early intervention, the school systems, doctors, insurance, therapists, mounds of paperwork, and thousands of phone calls, all while trying to raise their child. And while their friends and peers are busy with careers, their kids' dance lessons, French tutors, soccer practices. Parents with children who have disabilities are trying to find therapists who accept their insurance, plan a healthy menu for a child who will only eat beige-colored foods, and keep some semblance of normalcy in their life and in the lives of their family. So when Nick was 15, they knew he was ill. And because he was nonverbal, it took a trip to the ER to find the real diagnosis. <laughs> Nick was in stage five kidney failure due to obstruction. Nick had kidney and bladder stones that left him needing a life-saving kidney transplant. Up until this time, Nick had been on the wait list to receive his DD waiver for about five years. The removal of both his kidneys, requiring life support of dialysis four times a week, and a sympathetic social worker at the hospital finally gave Nick's family a clear path to being able to be approved for the waiver. There were many nights that they did not think Nick was going to survive. Ultimately, Nick did receive the life-saving transplant that he needed, but his pervasive developmental disability remains. It shouldn't have taken him being diagnosed as terminal before receiving the life support measures for his disability. Please recognize that these services our life support for the most vulnerable segment of our population. As your Congresswoman, I will be a stable and strong voice representing the disability community. I often talk about ensuring that the American dream is available for all, and that includes people with disabilities. So I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today, for taking the time to educate me on the issues facing this community, 
and I'm excited to continue to learn more on these topics and hear from you. I also look forward to showcasing how I will bring a new vision and a fresh perspective to these issues to advocate for change and a better tomorrow for this community. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karina. And now our last candidate vying to represent the 8th District will be joined by Teddy Fickray. And Teddy, we would love for your opening remarks to be shared. You are still on mute and we want to hear you. There we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so first and foremost, thank you uh, uh, to the ARC for inviting me to this forum. And uh, it's also an honor to uh, share the stage with a representative buyer and candidate at Lipsman. Uh, I'm new to this. Uh, this is my first I'm running, so I don't have necessarily the long list of uh, a record to kind of enumerate, but I could I talk about my own personal experiences and why I'm passionate about this issue uh, when it comes to uh, the rights of uh, the, the disabled or, uh, you know, especially abled Americans. Um, you know, from a time uh, as I was a child, my mom struggled with depression for most of her life, uh, was at times debilitating. Uh, and I, I know that's uh, counted as a form of dis, uh, disability by the American Disability uh, Association. Um, so that's something that really has close to home. Uh, and then uh, as I became an adult, uh, I have a nephew that has autism. And then there's a personal experience that I had in 2015, where I went through two years of homelessness. Uh, and during that time, uh, that time uh, period of my life, I befriended a lot of uh, homeless people uh, a lot of whom were disabled, disabled uh, veterans. And I myself, at one point, uh, I had an infection in my knee. Uh, we often say that we'll never know uh, about the plight of other people until we walk a mile in their shoes. Uh, and so for, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, when my knee got infected, it went septic and almost lost my leg. Uh, by the grace of God, I didn't. And for almost a year and a half, I walked with a very severe limp. Uh, I recovered fully but it left a, a very big imprint the, the, in my mind. The things that we take for granted, uh, the, you know, whether it's, it's having the ability to walk up or down the st uh, stairs without uh, too much difficulty, uh, being able to, to access buildings. Uh, when those things get taken away, you, un you come to understand uh, the plight uh, of the disabled uh, uh, you know, uh, society. Uh, one of the things I did not know that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of now, because I have someone who's a, a, a great champion of the disabled by the name of uh, Justin Boatner, is uh, up to 26% of Americans uh, have, you know, disabilities or, or, or different abilities. Uh, that is a significant number. And, and when you add in uh, depression, uh, anxiety, severe forms of mental illness, that number could even be higher than that. So to that point, uh, the rights of ensuring that the rights of uh, the disabled are, uh, you know, maintained and, uh, and um, you know, looked after is not just something for uh, them or other people, it's for all of us, because all of us, whether it's personally or because of our families, uh, have someone that we know uh, that is impacted by this. Uh, so for me, uh, running as an independent, one of the things I'm really uh, keen on, on, on working towards is getting beyond this us versus them divide and uh, looking at uh, lens, the lens of justice and inclusion through true inclusion, where, where no one is left behind. And uh, to that end, we had to start gauging the wellness of society, but not by the attainment of a very few at the top, but how the quote unquote least amongst us are doing. That, that's how we measure the, the health of society. So that's why, uh, you know, having these forums and discussing uh, these issues matter greatly uh, because, like I said, the, the rights of, of, of the disabled are basically ensuring that the rights of all are being uh, kept and maintained as well. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm new to this uh, stage, but it's an honor to be here and I'm looking forward to having this conversation so that, uh, you know, th through this conversation, more people are made aware. It's not just the people that are logging on here today, but that this conversation is amplified so that everyone understands that uh, this issue is something that is important to all Americans. Thank you. That's a great point about amplifying the things that we're hearing about tonight. And I'll give a quick reminder that since we're recording both on Facebook Live and here in Zoom, we'll have plenty of opportunities for candidates and participants to share the information later since we know life is tricky and folks can't always come live. So moving on to the 11th district, we're so pleased to hear from candidate Jim Miles. We would love to welcome your introductory remarks. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Jim Miles. 
and I am the Republican nominee. I'm here in the 11th Congressional District. I am a veteran. I'm a former Air Force fighter pilot. I'm currently married. Uh, I'm now a father of two, and our family, mer uh, our family moved here to Burke in 2004. But first, I want to thank uh, Lucy, Sharon, and Connor for the opportunity again to be here and introduce myself and speak with you about my background and experience. Uh, I enjoyed meeting Sharon and, and Connor at the, the great event last week that was led by Governor Yunkin. Uh, he'll be a key figure, I think, as we all move together to try to provide better care uh, for those in our communities that are fighting for our children, uh, that are facing serious medical uh, developmental challenges to lead a full and productive life. Uh, I bring my personal experience. I, I'm married, a father of two sons. Uh, I've had personal contact with a few close friends that face the challenges of raising children that, that suffer from severe uh, autism and other developmental delays. Uh, I also bring extensive experience from my 25 plus years of work in the Social Security Administration, uh, which included a year on Capitol Hill on the Republican staff in the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Social Security that also included supplemental security income benefits. I have personally interviewed, both as a claims representative and then as a United States Administrative Law Judge, thousands of children and parents that have been and are dealing with autism and serious developmental issues in our children. I have also been involved in many adult disability claims based on traumatic brain injury or cognitive losses with several years of experience dealing directly with CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I have also personally helped to develop regulatory and policy guidance that govern these benefit eligibility and entitlement programs. In my work on Capitol Hill, I work directly with the committee members of Congress that write and vote on legislation. And I became very involved in the research and findings of the numerous inspector general reports on these and other issues over the past decades of changes to these critical programs. Given limits on my time, I won't go into additional details on my background and, and career and work in the disability area, but you can rest assured that the past 25 years of my life have been focused on the Social Security Act, Title II and Title XVI disability benefits for adults and children, Medicare, and just general quality of life issues that affect millions of adults and children. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'll move over to our substantive question. And I think we'll start today um, by talking about an issue that we've had both people in the Q&A tonight and lots of folks in advance send questions about. And this is about social security asset limits. So the social security income or SSI program that candidate Miles just referenced a little bit in working with social security provides critical support for millions of people with disabilities to be able to afford necessities, food and rent. But it has rules that make it very hard for people to both save money and get out of poverty. SSI has an asset limit that was last updated in 1989. And assets include things like money in the bank, retirement account, savings, and inheritance from a parent that can come in very suddenly. And right now, people who can get SSI can only have at any moment up to $2,000 in assets. For married couples, that amount is $3,500 per person. Can you discuss your support for the Bipartisan SSI Savings Penalty Elimination Act or any other ideas you have to address this barrier to preventing, preventing people with disabilities from being able to work and earn to the greatest possible degree? Thank you, Lucy. That's a great question. And I think it's actually irresponsible for our elected officials to keep pushing this along unsuccessfully instead of proposing standalone legislation to pass this in a bipartisan manner versus including it in a bigger size legislation where it gets thrown away. 30 years is way too long. So I fully support establishing asset limits that take into account inflation, cost of living, SSI increases, and the need for some level of financial security beyond just one or two months of living expenses. Changes to these limits should be accompanied by aids for individuals to successfully manage increased financial resources. There are already measures in place to true up and refund assets that outlive an individual so that can provide some balance to address concerns of building up assets. And organizations such as the ARC could provide a valuable service to counsel and help individuals manage their financial security while staying within the bounds of Medicaid li asset limits. So this is absolutely crucial as it impacts 
what an individual can own, if they can drive, if they have direct access to a trust, all things that people with disabilities should be able to do and enjoy the opportunities that the rest of us have. So I would be for increasing the limits. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. And now Teddy will turn things over to you for the same question. I, I agree. Uh, you know, Social Security is meant to ensure that we don't fall uh, beneath the net. Uh, so to that end, uh, there should be, uh, I'm definitely for, all for increasing the SSI. Uh, this is at the end of the day, money that we paid into. Uh, I understand that, you know, if you have a lot of withdrawals, it could kind of, uh, you know, uh, could put into question the viability of, of Social Security uh, for the whole. But at the same token, uh, when people apply for SSI, there, it's because there's something that happened in their lives that requires it. And so we should, they should not have to go through all kinds of bureaucracy and, uh, and endure uh, all kinds of ordeals in order to get money that they actually paid into. So I'm all for increasing the SSI. And also part and parcel of that is also increasing the COLA uh, so that, you know, with the cost of inflation going through the roof, uh, as it stands right now, uh, we're, our, the money that we're paying into is, is, is almost, uh, it's, uh, it's almost a regressive uh, tax. So the COLA should go up to keep, uh, keep in line with the cost of living uh, uh, that keeps going up all the time. So we need to reformulate the uh, the, the way that's calculated so that we are able, able to actually uh, attain more from Social Security as opposed to the way that it's uh, calculated right now. Thank you so much. And now we'll turn the same question over to candidate Miles. Okay, well, thank you. I, I guess the first thing I'll say is maybe just a little bit of clarification. Uh, uh, Social Security benefits are different. They are taxable. There's a disabled adult child benefits that may, may go back into childhood and learning disabilities, but that's a different program. Uh, then you have supplemental security income that is uh, an eligibility based on uh, medical concerns, but also financial resources. And that's kind of what the question I think here is trying to reach is the financial resources uh, eligibility. And there's many rules under supplemental security with spend down what you can own, cars, homes, and it's way beyond what we want to talk about today. But I think what we can all see is that the, the amounts of money, the resource limits are low, but I don't really think that's the issue here that we need to address. I think the issue here that we really need to address is the spending priorities of Congress. And what we've seen, and again, I don't want to, I know the ground rules here get critical, but we're giving tax credits for certain things, uh, 7,500 for electric cars that could maybe be used in a different way. And I think that's the key here uh, with these resource limits and supplemental security income what we need to do is we need to examine, and we can use the IG reports, the Inspector General reports, we can use the Congressional Budget Office. There's so many tools that a member of Congress has, and we can examine the costs and the benefits to, uh, to uh, making these resource limits higher. But we wanna make sure that as we bring in more people uh, to enjoy these very, very necessary benefits, that it doesn't affect the quality of these benefits. And that's the key is we need to decide how much money we wanna spend on the programs. And I think that's where Congress, uh, there's a lot of, of talk and, and taking credit, but I think the people in the disability community have seen where the rubber meets the road. Uh, they're really not getting a lot of money, especially with all these COVID uh, trillions of dollars. I don't think it's translating uh, into the disability communities here. And I think that's what we need to do. And finally, I just take a look at uh, the rules for accountable resources and deductions, especially uh, people that are really having trouble making ends meet, but they can also show maybe they're caring for family members and other things. And perhaps we can look at, at how the resources are counted to meet the two and $3,000 limits. And even assuming we don't raise those to find some way to maybe consider uh, families that are having especially difficult times uh, to tweak that a little bit or change uh, those requirements. And I think if we take that approach, uh, everyone will benefit. Thank you. Thank you so much. And lastly, we'll pass this question over to Representative Beyer. Uh, I can just say ditto. Um, you absolutely need to, to raise these limits. Yeah, $2,000, when you figure for many Americans, that's 15 days worth of expenses. That's just nothing. Um, yeah, I, I checked it. it has not been introduced in the House yet, or else I'd be a co-sponsor of it. Uh, we need to look and find out why it hasn't been, but maybe I can lead that right, right away. In the meantime, um, I've been working closely with the ABLE accounts 
uh, which I think is a really interesting way to effectively support people with disabilities. The Able Accounts Congress Act was created in 2014, only goes up to age 26. And yet we have many, many people that get disabled after age 26, you know, through diabetes or an accident or something happens to your knee. So we need to be able to really extend that another 20 years. And uh, I've asked to be a co-sponsor of that legislation. Um, Karina had mentioned about how sometimes difficult it is to get standalone legislation. Um, I, I wish the U.S. Congress worked like the Virginia General Assembly does, where we take up lots of pieces one thing at a time. Uh, unfortunately, even naming a post office right now takes about half an hour um, because of the way the rules are working with my Republican pals. Um, but I will continue to work as hard as I can for both of these bills, uh, and they make enormous sense. Okay, so we are going to change gears a little bit here and ask about another question um, related to actually how I spent my afternoon getting a call from a school social worker. So we'll tie right in there. So people with disabilities are arrested and incarcerated far out of proportion with their numbers in the population. And this is especially true for people with disabilities who are also people of color. Uh, we see this community being coerced into committing crimes, falsely admitting to crimes out of the learned desire to please people or echolalia for speeding back what's been asked of them. Um, we would love your thoughts on how we start to turn this trend around. And candidate Bikre, you're up first. That's actually a, 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 something that um, I haven't really thought about before about the, the, the impact uh, that it has on uh, on this community. Uh, the fact that it's something they just said right now that they need to kind of please people and do things that uh, that that they might be more susceptible to to coercion. So uh, maybe a, a big part of what we need to do is is have uh, you know be aware of this and have training that that addresses this. Uh, you know, there's uh, overall when more people are feeling hopeless and depressed and. And I feel like there's uh, no hope for the future. They're, they're a lot more uh, attuned to uh, to commit crime. Uh, so maybe part of what we need to do is uh, instead of being uh, coercive and, and punitive, uh, we need to actually uh, meet people where, where they're at and, and focus on uh, you know uh, reviving and, and restoring hope in their lives. And so, uh, and, and this is uh, definitely the case when it comes to the disabled and and people that have uh, learning that, uh, disabilities. Uh, so it's it's making sure that uh, legislation is passed uh, that that is not punitive and takes into account uh, where people are at uh, mentally and where they're at in terms of uh, the, their ability to understand the the true impact of the decisions that they're making. Uh, so uh, in, in that sense, uh, maybe it's 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 a lot more of of uh, ensuring that uh, you know prosecutors and and cops are, are, are trained to look at these things and, and, and make considerations based on this instead of just, uh, you know, going for the statistics and, and trying to get as many people as locked up as possible. We need to consider the 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 uh, the, the abilities that they, uh, people have and whether or not they have the, the true uh, understanding of, of how that impacts uh, their, their lives going forward. Thanks so much. And now we'll ask the same question of candidate Jim Miles. Hi, <laughs> thank you, yeah. I think this question is, is just kind of indicative of how complex this whole uh, issue of, of supplemental security and developmental delays and, and how it starts at birth and, and continues on uh, into adulthood even for, for so many. And, and as far as crime as incarceration rates, it's certainly a big issue. I think the first thing we need to do from a federal level is we need to support our community partners. And, and we've certainly seen that here in, in the Northern Virginia area. area. There's certain uh, uh, police departments that, that are making special efforts to help this community and, and treat and uh, properly engage with these individuals. And I would suggest uh, as a federal matter, perhaps we can make special efforts to fund these programs and give them a priority basis uh, because the police, uh, if it gets to that level, it, we certainly want them with partners as we try to help uh, solve some of these problems and redirect uh, uh, these young men and women to a, a more productive life. But I also ask, well, is this a school issue? Because I think we need to back up just a little bit. Uh, because my experience in dealing uh, with thousands of these cases, I mean, I've reviewed 
so many uh, IEPs and in, in the school programs and, and where you are, and you can just kind of see a pattern that develops uh, very early, uh, where if you get good intervention in schools and you get uh, a lot of interested teachers and resources, pretty soon uh, the functional limitations, which is how supplemental security income uh, generally rates whether one qualifies for, for childhood disability benefits is, is the functional limitations that it imposes. And, and I believe it was six domains. It's been a few years since I've, I've done that personally. But you could see how schools with good resources and interested development could really help turn children away uh, from potentially a, a future that would involve crime and be used by other people to commit crimes. And we need to do that. But ultimately, if the schools fail, and I don't mean fail in that sense, but if the schools are just unable to, to, to correct behavior or, or give a better path, I think we need to look at violent versus nonviolent uh, individuals. You can certainly uh, consider segregation in our jails of, of those with, you, we have IQ testing, we have so many resources to identify people that have developmental uh, issues and intellectual disabilities, and we can use those and maybe segregate them and protect them in our jail populations. But we could also examine early release in appropriate cases so that people have been uh, used uh, or tricked or whatever that, that uh, we can uh, show some compassion and perhaps give them an early release. But we also need to, again, work with the halfway houses or how we're going to release them back into, into regular society to make sure that we just don't dump them and leave them. Because I think uh, everyone in these processes and these forums, we've all uh, can see uh, what happens if you don't really spend the time. Everything just comes back to the start again. And we really need to invest to change direction for, for these people. And I think that's really important. Uh, and I also think uh, especially trained police would be very helpful because a lot of especially autism and other developmental delays uh, really hurt communicative skills and there's problems with social interaction. And if we had especially trained a uh, part of the police force, it could be incentivized uh, or people with degrees that are especially uh, beneficial in these areas, they could work in those programs and deal directly with individuals that might have greater problems with social interaction and they could diffuse those situations and it would have a much better result. So again, it's a, a combination of different things and it's all about resources, whereas a society, we wanna spend our money and if I'm in Congress, we're going to spend our money. I've seen 25 years of, of disability, uh, children and parents, and how difficult it is for them. And we need to start to fund the programs. And, and I, I just say, and I don't want to be, be negative, but with all this money we've just spent, I really don't think that, that we've done a very good job of taking care of, of, of a population that is in great need. And, and we need to do that as a, as a society. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'll ask the same question about that, the disability and justice intersection to Representative Byer. Thanks, Lucy, very much. This is uh, is almost too close to home uh, for me. I'd mentioned earlier that my son has schizophrenia. So it, needless to say, he's been picked up by the police more than once. Um, usually, I mean, the police have been wonderful with him. But you know, the first instance, of course, is they're treating his psychosis as a crime and only later um, as a, a disability. You know, there are 600,000 Americans with schizophrenia in our jails and prisons. You talk to any one of our sheriffs in Northern Virginia, our four sheriffs, they'll tell you the biggest problem they have is the number of people that are locked up with disabilities rather than, you know, deeply criminal behavior. Um, I was deeply involved in the Earl Washington case 1982, he was arrested in Culpeper for the rape and murder of a young woman named Williams. And um, he was picked up for something else, you know, uh, burglaring a house or whatever. Um, they, they questioned him all night and he confessed and he was on death row for years and years. Um, even that was abundantly clear that he only confessed um, because he had a severe um, intellectual disability and he was trying to please the police officers. Even the police officers didn't think he was guilty. When they finally did the DNA test, he was released. David Vasquez was a janitor in Arlington in the early 1980s, uh, also with an intellectual disability. A woman was raped and strangled there. He confessed, again, after extensive police questioning. Um, turns out it was uh, an entirely different person who did it. And after 10 years on death row, David Vasquez was released. Most of you on the call will be familiar with the case of Nellie Latson. The 19-year-old young man with Asperger's syndrome arrested on the courthouse 
steps in Stafford by a police officer who scared the Dickens out of him. And he ended up having four assault charges against him before uh, took about a year for justice finally to intervene. You know, this really is a matter of policing. I'm the opposite end of the defund the police movement. I think we need to give the police a lot more money. Um, there's some wonderful work being done at NYU on disaggregating police functions that not often do police need to respond to, you know, a violent crime in progress or even a crime in progress. A lot of times it's just disability issues. And uh, one of the things now that earmarks are back, thank goodness, one of my earmarks that was successfully done was to create a mental health unit for the Arlington police to accompany the police in those times when it's necessary. I'm very proud to say that in Alexandria, more than 80 of the police officers have completed the mental health first aid training. Uh, so we're, we're, we're coming, but there's much, much more that needs to be done to make sure that we differentiate from the people that are actually bad guys, um, you know, to committing real crimes and those that are just in need of a lot of services um, that for whatever reason right now, our police are our first, first call um, and we need to make sure that they have the resources, the training, um, the culture that gives them the ability to respond appropriately. So I yield back, thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll ask the same question lastly of candidate Lipsman about disability and justice issues. Thank you, Lucy. Um, this is something that's very uh, near and dear because I just had the pleasure of talking with Thomas and Thomas is the son of Kari, who's uh, the president of the Arlington Autism Society. And Thomas is autistic and bipolar. He's bright, he's articulate, he's hardworking. And he was telling me that during the hot months of summer, is when his bipolar episodes occur. And so we got to talking about the justice system and how if for whatever reason he's driving or trying to get to work and he has an, a bipolar episode and if a police officer is not able to tell the difference between that being an episode or him actually uh, being a criminal, that poses a problem. And so something that we need to do is to work hand in hand, families, um, teachers, and uh, first responders, they all need to work together. Our system of justice begins with the first responders. And I commend the programs that the ARC sponsors to better prepare individuals and law enforcement officers for better outcomes in these various interactions. And so the other thing that we can do is to have our police officers visit classrooms so they can see and identify the act the specific behaviors so that they in turn are able to identify them in a moment. As you know, our police officers have split seconds to make a decision. And so the more we equip them with the information, the better off they are making the right decision and making sure that the um, innocent are not being charged as criminals. So working hand in hand with families and law enforcement officers. Uh, Fairfax Sheriff's Office um, also has a program called Project Lifesaver, which serves the impairment, the needs of the impaired um, adults who have autism, Down syndrome, or cognitive impairment, such as dementia or uh, Alzheimer's. And that may cause them to chronically wander around and not find their way back. And the uh, program has done a fantastic job of being able to serve uh, this community and make sure that uh, those who are wondering are not absolutely lost. They are actually able to come back home and be safe. And currently, there's actually a sh shortage in the law enforcement officers. Um, so the program has actually been temporarily suspended. And I ensure, will ensure that we don't run into that issue by funding our police, by making sure that they have the resources they need, the education that they need in order to identify these issues. And then the second part of this question is our system of justice is the courts and the legal uh, representation. And we can do more to engage local attorneys to assist compromised individuals facing legal actions like the instances everyone was talking about on uh, individuals who have disabilities and are coerced to commit these crimes or confess to crimes that they did not do. 
So I will work directly to make sure that we have all of our resource officers, all of our law enforcement officers trained and understand what it means to serve our community and serve the community that is in most need. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you very much. And now we'll change gears a little bit and talk about some of the issues that sometimes we see those justice interactions, which is uh, a lack of other supports and services. So folks with developmental disabilities and a range of other disabilities rely on home and community-based services, commonly called HCBS, for everyday things like supports on the job, getting around the community, dressing, bathing, taking medication, et cetera. But there's not enough money in the HCBS program to support everyone who needs care. About 800,000 people across the country and 14,000 in Virginia are sitting on waiting lists with no services despite being eligible for support. All too often, this means we have unpaid family members filling in gaps of care, causing them to lose jobs, burn out, and enter very expensive crises, trips to the ER, and calls to the police, as we've referenced. The pandemic, on top of these existing challenges, has made disability direct support workers harder and harder to come by. We are hoping to see a historic change in this way of looking at disability funding, and we would love your thoughts on how we address these crises, both in Virginia and nationwide. Candidate Miles, please take us away. I think I got the longest question so far, but uh, it's a good question, and I think a difficult one. Uh, the direct caregiver issue, um, what are they, $15 an hour? I, I'm not sure what the minimum wage is, but I think we need to examine this uh, uh, two ways. I need to recognize that there's a difference between a paid uh, direct caregiver and then there's a family caregiver uh, that might not be able to work because they're trying to take care of a, of a loved one. And there's many tools that are in our tool bag that we can use, things like incentives and funding, uh, use of the tax code, uh, when I look at the paid uh, direct caregivers that would come into to the home, uh, I think we need to explore, again, this area is of greatest need. There's uh, certain uh, parts of states and cities that might have a greater need, and we need to look at that. We can also incentivize uh, perhaps tax incentives, fuel expense uh, coverages, things like that, in, in uh, maybe some of the salaries for people that uh, are in this particular profession could get some kind of tax benefit. So we can do a little bit of tweaking there with the uh, paid uh, direct caregivers, but to try to encourage a maybe more interest, uh, we can uh, retool social service budgets. Again, these are complex problems, but there's also so many potential sources uh, of a remedy and assistance, but we need uh, leaders in our government that are interested in helping and not just making sound bites about how they're helping uh, this and that with the, the budget allocations of, of this and that, where it doesn't really translate into measurable progress that we should all be able to see. Uh, with a family provider, again, we can use tax credit, especially with a two-parent family, maybe where one parent is working and the other parent is a full-time care provider, uh, some kind of a significant tax credit to help offset there. Uh, with a single parent family, again, what a difficult a road these and I met so many it, it's a very difficult life and I, I have nothing but admiration for uh, for the load that so many of these these people carry but uh, we have to make sure in, in through tax incentive or other uh, programs and benefits that they have money for food and inadequate uh, heating during during the winter and perhaps at least intermittent care from a, a paid caregiver to just give a, a parent especially a single parent just a break uh, I'd also consider enlisting church and faith communities to help shoulder the burden. I know at my church, uh, on, on occasion, they have a program where they uh, encourage, and it's generally uh, limited to the congregation, but perhaps that can be expanded to the general community uh, that have special needs children where they can bring them in and leave them and be, uh, you know, confident with the supervision and the care that they're going to get to maybe just go out and have lunch together, at, you know, at, at two a uh, husband and wife in, uh, or just to get a break from the, from the stress that's inherent in trying to, you know, to care for, for a child that's uh, uh, suffered those developmental issues. But again, I think it always comes back to follow the money. Uh, we got a $1.9 trillion. Where did all that go to help this population so negatively impacted? Uh, I would also look at CMS. Uh, they do have waivers. They work with the state. And if you have severely uh, impaired uh, children, sometimes you can get an, a, a waiver uh, from CMS that can increase the benefit amounts or, or help to those families. 
And I think that we need to take a look at that. Uh, we might also try to recruit a dedicated uh, home service cadre where we, they could be recognized and encouraged and perhaps get a, a better pay and, and do it a, as a group. And they could be a part of a cadre, part of a community and do that. And, and I guess lastly, uh, as the federal government, uh, perhaps we could try uh, without being directly involved just to, to provide a little bit more uh, unity or guidelines or guidances just uh, across the states uh, for people that might move or go to a different area where they don't have to start again from scratch. And I think that's something that could be done uh, you know, without a lot of expense or a lot of regulation, which uh, just at the end of the day, I think saps out uh, benefits for people that really need it. So a, a long answer. I'm sorry. That was kind of a long question. Thank you. That's fair. A complicated issue demands long <laughs> well, question, demands long answer. <laughs> so we won't fault anybody for that. Um, but we will ask the same question now of Representative Byer, but I won't ask the super long question again. So your thoughts on home and community-based services. Okay, well, 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 Jim has covered the waterfront, which I appreciate. So I just like to make three points. Um, number one, the biggest single issue is housing. You know, the, the last I paid attention, it was there was a 10,000 person backlog just in Virginia for those with intellectual disabilities. And it doesn't count the other disabilities that are out there, um, which include mental health and, and physical and sensory disabilities. Um, I, you know, we worked for years to try to get my sister into one. My, my other sister and my niece have been part of community <laughs> housing for years, trying to help those that can't afford it. But it's a huge, huge problem. Just in Northern Virginia, not including folks with disabilities, we're 150,000 housing units short. We have good legislation in Congress that the LIHTC bill, I'm the lead co-sponsor with Susan Del Benny out of Washington, which would create 2 million more affordable homes in America over the next eight years. We keep passing it in the House. We can't pass it in the Senate, but um, that's a, a, the function of the filibuster. Uh, but we will keep working at it. And this, uh, Jim talked about using tax credits. All this does is improves the tax credit by 50% for people to build affordable housing and specifically for those with disabilities. A second major issue is the the in the American Rescue Plan, which we passed last February. There's 460 million dollars for home and community-based services. That's a, that's a lot of money, but still a drop in the bucket compared to all that's needed. We put 400 billion. That's with a B, not an M, in the Build Back Better Act, which never passed. And sadly, the the net version of it, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, doesn't include that money. Uh, I know we complain about it, but we put the money out there, but we still have to get the bills passed. Um, the good news about the Inflation Reduction Act, though, is it caps drug prices for Medicare, gives them the ability to negotiate it for the first time in history. And that's going to make an enormous difference for all those people with disabilities that have to fill, fulfill prescriptions. It also extends the, the Affordable Care Act subsidies. It was going to get pretty unaffordable for a lot of people right away. But having passed that bill, the president signed it, that's going to help, too. But then on the largest single picture, the one job we can't automate is caregiving. Um, and it is the job that has the greatest explosion right now. You just think of the fact that we're getting older and older and 50% of the people that reach age 85 will have some measure of dementia, Alzheimer's particularly. Uh, those are all caregivers paid for and unpaid for. It's a huge, huge single burden on families right now with those caregivers. Um, and yet they typically, when they're paid, they're underpaid and they're often not paid at all. Finding a, a public policy solution to caregiving is one of the great challenges that lie ahead. Um, I don't, uh, by the way, for those who have the naive thought that caregiving is easy, I've watched the caregivers take care of my, my father-in-law, um, who was a frail man by his age, but moving them, turning them over, getting them up to eat, changing their diapers, all that stuff is very, very hard, very stressful, and often leads to lots of injuries. So for us, I think we have to be thinking very constructively about the role of the caregiver and how we pay for them in order to have them available for the many, many folks with disabilities who need that caregiver. Thanks so much for the question. I yield back. Thank you so much. And so now we'll turn things over to candidate Lipsman to talk to us about home and community-based services. Thank you for the question, Lucy. So 10 plus years of wait is absolutely unacceptable. And that's the current time frame why, which uh, the average family waits for um, these services. 
And I personally don't see this as a lack of funding, but I see this as a lack of prioritizing of funding tax dollars. And the federal dollars may be available, but as you know, require state legislations to approve state level waiting list slots. And I would work with committees to identify federal incentives that would encourage states to approve more HCBS as slots. Solutions best happen at the local and state level, and we know that. As Congressman Beyer pointed out, things take a very long time to pass on the federal level. And so Northern Virginia has been a leader in advancing the progress on these issues. And politics and grandstanding has gotten in the way of funding the programs that actually help people, families, and save people. So I promise to have a staffer specifically focused on this community dedicated to the needs of the residents in my district. And the second part of the question in terms of caregivers and the shortage of caregivers, my mother was actually a caregiver. Um, she had to supplement her income. She was a full-time seamstress. And when we came to America, we lived in low-income housing, survived on food stamps, did not speak English. And so this was a way for her to learn to earn a little bit of extra income. And so I remember tagging along with her and watching how hard she had to work. And I remember how much she was paid and it was pennies on the dollar for all the work that she had to do, changing diapers, bathing, cooking meals, just being there, having conversations, mentally, physically, emotionally draining jobs and very unappreciated jobs, but so important and so crucial to this community. So it's mind boggling to me that this continues to be an issue to this day. And this was uh, you know, more than 20 years ago. She was also able to gain experience while she was being a caregiver. And I know that a lot of immigrants tend to be caregivers in this industry. So this is an opportunity to propel our immigrants who want to integrate into our society to give them a career path, um, which now allowed my mother to be able to go into the healthcare industry, specifically focused on caregiving. Um, so we should have advancements um, in careers, incentives for people to grow in this industry, uh, trade school options for people uh, in this field, because the last thing we want to do is institutionalize our children. So there are other options that we can do right now to make sure that we have the funding and the resources necessary for caregivers and also working with our committees and our communities at the state and local level to ensure that there are enough slots um, to account for the disability community. So thank you so much for the question. Thank you so much. And it is an important one. So Teddy, you are up with your thoughts on Helmet Community Debate Services here. Sure, I kind of take a different approach to this. You know, a, a central tenet of my campaign is that we need to be able to make more decisions where we live locally. Uh, as it stands, uh, over, you know, 33 or 35% of our income is being shipped out to DC. And then we're, we're waiting for that to be doled back to us by way of uh, various services or exemptions or uh, some type of credit. Uh, to be honest, what we need to do is be able to keep more of our money so we can make decisions for ourselves. Uh, there's no reason why uh, a, a teacher or a janitor or a veteran is paying more marginal taxes than uh, uh, you know someone like Bezos or Gates. So you know if we're able to keep more of our uh, resources where we live, there's a lot of secondary and, and tertiary and all kinds of benefits that come come along with it. And part of that is to alleviate the burdens that's being uh, borne by families. Uh, maybe uh, people will be, uh, they didn't feel the need to work, uh, both, uh, you know, uh, a wife and husband feel the need to work all the time, uh, work two jobs and, and still not be able to keep up with their bill. Maybe one of them will be able to actually care for their parents uh, or uh, if they have enough income, they, they could, uh, you know, get their own uh, a caregiver instead of uh, depending on the program. Um, so the way that is right now, we, we spend so much money to DC uh, and then we end up getting uh, into a log jam to where we wait 10 years, 10 plus years uh, to get enrolled in, in special programs. This is not only for caregivers, this is the same thing, whether it's for uh, the VA and other uh, programs that, that benefit uh, the, the disabled community and really all of us. You know, one of the things that we really have to take away from this is that if we're really gonna advance 
uh, the cause of justice and 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 better the uh, the lives of all. We had to kind of interconnect the pains and struggles of every community into into one into a collective uh, effort. Uh, so so that the the pain of one becomes the pain of all. So in this way, all Americans need to understand that the the plight of uh, of, of the disabled who have to uh, depend on caregivers that's something that hits home for all of us. So if, if, if there's if Americans feel the uh, the benefit of uh, being able to keep more of, their, of our uh, resources uh, locally, uh, so that we're not dependent on a uh, on a big government to do this for us, or uh, or also we're able to re reinvest our money locally, so we could empower small more small businesses, which by derivative ends up creating more competition for workers, that would uh, give rise to uh, better wages, uh, and that would also have the benefit of of lowering inflation because with more competition, uh, uh, prices drop. So I think we need to look at this in a different perspective. Uh, instead of keep sending all as much money as we're spending and then uh, expecting a middleman to, to give us the benefits back, let us keep more of our money. One of the things that I'm kind of introducing and, and still kind of exploring is this idea under a certain threshold of making taxes voluntary uh, so that people that were able to pay taxes will pay taxes and those who can't will, will be able to keep it. Uh, and there's a, a, a benefit to this in many different ways. Uh, first and foremost, when people uh, feel as though what you know they're giving to a greater cause, study after study of someone have that people that actually overgive when they're able to, and those who can are not able to, and the money that is kept locally is reinvested instead of being uh, wasted on, on a, a you know a, on a corruption and 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 all kinds of uh, you know theft that that's being done in the, in the dark of night. So you know at the end of the day, we the people are supposed to be a, a charge. Let us keep our money where we live so that we can make decisions for ourselves. We don't need a, a, a third party or a second party making decisions for us. Uh, that's part of the, the main reasons why I, I felt compelled to want to begin with. You know, we had to build a, a sense of community within ourselves where we live. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the things that's being destroyed in America, uh, especially with the advent of COVID-19 and uh, social isolation. Uh, the, the sense of community is being lost every day. And part of that is the sense of financial independence. So if we're able to keep more of our money uh, and then we also take it upon ourselves to start building our communities, to start uh, uh, you know, reinvesting our money where we live, that ends up uh, you know, lifting the burdens that we feel. And, and, and that creates a lot more entrepreneurs and people that are caretakers that might be able to, to start their own businesses uh, so that it, it benefits uh, not only the disabled community, but all of us in the process. Thank you for that question. Thank you for your answer. And for our next question, we're going to start off with Representative Byer. And now we'd love to ask a little bit about a big slogan in the disability community. So we're big believers there should be nothing about us without us. People with lived experiences, including many people joining us tonight, have invaluable thoughts and ideas to contribute on how to best run our country and our policies. We would love your thoughts on in the future working with individuals with disabilities and making sure those voices are really steering disability policy, um, including recognizing disability pride. Yeah, yes, I, I heartily agree. <clears throat> I think I've mentioned throughout the course of the last hour that the many personal experiences I've had, family and coworkers and the like that have had disabilities. And we've always been committed to the idea that every person with a disability wants to be as independent as possible. Um, in the course of the, my business career, we had many people with multiple sclerosis, with cerebral palsy. Um, we often hired folks with intellectual disabilities to work with us in the shop. Um, diabetes, of course, uh, has become a major issue with so many of the folks that we work with. Um, at, on the Hill, um, we've had uh, a whole string of different individuals with intellectual disabilities who come in, you know, leave the shelter workshop and come work with us for one day a week. Um, so, yes, it's very much part of making sure that um, everybody is, is part of the solution, part of the discussion. Uh, I mentioned my sister was president of People First, the self-advocacy. Um, she obviously, among others, taught me how important it is to make sure that People with the disabilities who understand their lives and their challenges um, are out there speaking. When I chaired the Virginia Disability Commission for those eight years, every year we would do hearings, usually six or eight around the state, 
which would usually last two to four hours. And it was an opportunity to have those folks come and talk and guide the policies. And most of the things that we law, laws and, and investments that we passed came from the people who had that lived experience. Um, so yes, uh, I'm all in and will continue to be so in every way I can. And thanks so much for the good question. Thank you so much. And now candidate Lipsman, same question to you about nothing about us without us. I could not agree anymore. I think that working hand in hand with the community is the only way that we're gonna really understand what the true challenges and needs are. And so over the last few months that I've been working with uh, you, Lucy and Sharon and Connor and the ARC, I've been so fortunate to hear so many stories, so many issues that have been unresolved for years and decades, uh, as we pointed out earlier with the social security um, benefits. And so I think it's extremely important that we work together. And I would designate a staffer that will work with the community, interact with them directly, and not just once a week or once a month. This is permanent. This is something that I will take with me to Capitol Hill. You will be heard. I will represent you and I will stand up for you and protect this community. And we will craft legislation together as partnerships. Your opinions and thoughts matter. They're important. They are what's going to allow us to influence the legislation that's currently there and actually be able to pass a lot of it because they're gonna hear directly from you. How unique is it to have Connor in the halls of Congress telling his story? That impact alone just touches everybody and sends shivers down my spine when I first heard his story. So I will be an advocate in this community. I will be working alongside you. And I really much am looking forward to addressing a lot of the issues that we talked about today and making sure that your needs are being met. So thank you so much for the question. Thank you so much for your answer. And now we'll turn the same question over to candidate Perky and you're on. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Lucy. Uh, yeah, I, I take very much to heart uh, making sure that uh, the, the, the voices of the disabled community is heard. Uh, in fact, uh, I have someone who's a fierce advocate of the disabled uh, by the name of Justin Bonner, who's on my staff. Uh, he attends every, uh, every uh, you know, staff meeting that we have on a weekly basis. I've learned a lot from him. Uh, and so uh, that's something I will commit to as well. But one of the things I want to note is that it's not enough to just hire someone uh, and, 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 you know, uh, have almost like just a PR move, uh, but beyond that, actually uh, commit to uh, ensuring that the needs of, of, of the disabled are being met on the ground. Uh, it's not enough to just have someone, uh, you know, on the staff. What we need to do is, like I said, is we, we gauge uh, the, the wellness of society, not by so how the what to do are doing, uh, but by how, how the needs of, of the people that are have the least resources are, are, are being met. Uh, so to that end, we have to, uh, to really uh, be committed to, uh, to ensuring that we fund properly uh, the needs of the disabled. Uh, part of that too is, is, is you know, we not, must stop this endless uh, awards of choice, uh, this uh, uh, foreign uh, adventures that we keep going on and focus on rebuilding America. You know, America is buckling at the seams. Uh, more, you know, there's a figure that I saw where 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. We cannot afford to be the police of the world anymore. We need, especially when our house is on fire. We need to be firefighters for, for America and put out the fire that's here. And part of that is to get away from this toxic us versus them narrative and, and, and create a true sense of inclusion that, that includes the rights of the disabled in every community across the board. We cannot look at, at, uh, at society as uh, you know, interest groups. We're all in this collectively. Because like I said, when 26% of Americans uh, have uh, some form of disability or another, that's every family. So the rights of the disabled in this way are the rights of everyone. And, and the plight of the least is the plight of the rest. So when we started pushing things like that, then we had to start understanding uh, that it's not just about uh, who's in DC, who's on what staff, but how the needs of, of the disabled and every other community are being met on the ground where, where they live uh, and ensuring that 
the God-given potential are being, uh, are being able to, to be realized. And you can't enforce equality, but what we can hope for is equality of opportunity. Uh, everyone should have the opportunity to succeed in life. And no one should, should start life with an anchor around their, uh, around their leg. So that's what I'm committed to, uh, to ensuring that the rights of the disabled uh, are fully uh, being addressed and the, voice, uh, the voices uh, that are actually are fierce advocates would, would be on my staff, but to go beyond that and ensuring that the, uh, the needs of people on the ground are being met as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to candidate Miles, the same question, nothing about us without us. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think this really has to be, uh, it's gotta be a combined federal and state effort. And I think we're fortunate here in Virginia, Governor Yunkin, uh, he's shown, uh, I think, a sincere, and sincere, a sincere desire uh, to help improve our public schools. And I think that's important. In this leadership, it'll help us to all provide an opportunity at the state level here uh, to improve the breadth and the quality of services in our IEP development and support programs in our public schools. Uh, beyond that, on the federal level, I think our elected uh, representatives need to quit talking and they need to start doing. They need to obtain dedicated funding to particular programs, and they need to provide oversight that the money is spent wisely and leads to improvements at all levels in our develop, developmentally challenged communities. And as your congressman, I commit that I will do that for you. Uh, we can use CMS oversight that's inherent in the Medicaid waiver process uh, to perhaps increase uniformity across states to make the programs more predictable and efficient uh, to serve this most vulnerable population. Again, together, parents with state and federal governments, we can make changes to improve the employment potential and the quality of life for the children and their families that battle these, these developmental delays. And I think we owe that to our most vulnerable children and their families so we can give them nothing less. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll switch our spotlights here so our interpreters can be seen. Okay, and we have 7.15 p.m. on the clock. So with respect to folks' time and to the many folks who sent in questions, as a reminder, I have about 35 unanswered questions between <laughs> those we drafted and those you all have sent, and we've been able to get through seven. So um, we know that folks wanted to hear the answers to their questions. As a reminder, when I send out um, follow-up information to the candidates, they will get your unanswered questions. But in the time remaining, we wanted to turn it back to each candidate to give a chance to give a one to two minute closing remark. Um, if there's a question or an issue we didn't get to touch on tonight that you really wanted to highlight, anything you wanted to recap, um, contact information to yourself. This is your time to share anything that you would like. And Karina Lipsman, you get the first, last word. Thank you so much, Lucy. So again, thank you for having me here. Thank you all the candidates for participating in this very important dialogue. However, I must say, we've heard a lot of promises tonight from our current elected official. And unfortunately, these are the same policies that were made in 2020 at the same forum. If you can take away one thing from tonight, is that new leadership is needed to affect change. Two years ago, my opponent said that keeping all students safe act would have passed if it was not for COVID. It still hasn't passed. The bill has 112 democratic sponsors in a democratic controlled Senate, House and White House. This legislation has failed to move. Also at the same forum two years ago, my opponent referenced his bill, the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. With 170 bipartisan co-sponsors and companion bipartisan legislation in the Senate has also failed to move. So one thing is clear, promises were made and promises were broken. I have struggled through life to, learn, to earn every single thing that I have. I came to this country with absolutely nothing. I don't have family legacy wealth to be able to take care of my children if they are disabled. That is a luxury the majority of people in this district do not have. It's time for change. It's time for a fighter. It's time for someone who will not sit back and let the political elite and the status quo continue to break the promises made with no accountability. I will keep my promises to you. I will keep my promises to Northern Virginia. And if I don't, I ask that you vote me out of office. So thank you again for allowing me to be here. 
Thank you for allowing me to learn from you and to continue to learn from you. And I encourage you to visit KarinaForCongress.com to learn more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And for your closing remarks, candidate Teddy Birke, you are on. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. I wanna say uh, thank you to the ARC for inviting me and also to Representative uh, Byer, Ms. Slipsman and uh, candidate uh, Miles as well. Uh, this is the first time for me. Uh, I'm new to the block, I guess you could say. Uh, but you know, when I decided to declare for uh, office and um, and you know uh, get with the, the thousand signatures needed on my own, one of the things that was really motivating me is uh, I realized just how uh, toxic our political discourse has become in America. Uh, I'm a first generation immigrant from Ethiopia. Uh, the reason that we uh, arrived here uh, in uh, 1982 was because I, you know, within the same year that I was born, there was political strife uh, where the, the, the king of Ethiopia at that time was deposed and shortly after 500,000 Ethiopians lost their lives. You know, when, when people felt a sense of hopelessness uh, and a sense of, of just a frustration, uh, it's very easy uh, for, uh, for people to become susceptible to demagogues and then the worst thing could happen, uh, w w you know, what once seemed impossible becomes a glaring horror. Uh, and so I, I hope that's not the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the slippery slope that America is headed towards, but it's undeniable that this uh, toxic and tribal politics that we've entered into, into, into for such a long time is just not working for us. That's why I'm running as an independent. I think it's time for a new approach where we get beyond us versus them. Uh, we get beyond the, you know, vacillating between two political parties uh, that keep promising uh, change only for us to get the same results and try a different approach. And part of that for me is, you know, I'm running uh, not only as an independent, but someone who's refused to take a penny from a corporation uh, or, and take big, uh, big donations altogether. Uh, you know, I, I work two jobs. Uh, by day, I'm an IT project manager. I drive Uber part-time. This is the new reality. And the question uh, that I put before my voters is, what more represents you? Uh, as, you know, someone who understands the day to day struggles uh, and, 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 you know, and works hard. And I'm not and by any means uh, insinuating that others are not working hard. I'm just saying that we uh, have to get to a place where, uh, you know, where money does not make might, um, does not make right. Uh, the merit of ideas uh, should be what, what wins out. Uh, so me running for Congress in, in a large way is, is uh, putting forth my, uh, my best effort to get to this point. Uh, it's very easy to keep focusing on what's wrong uh, in the world, but at, at a certain point, we have to focus on solutions. So that's what my campaign is about. If you want to find out more about uh, where I stand on the issues and what I'm about, you can go to the website, which is uh, www.f as in Frank, I K R E, figure number four, va.com. And you can also reach out to me at any time. Uh, it's uh, info at figure for va.com. Again, thank you for the art for uh, sponsoring this, uh, such a wonderful event. Uh, and uh, for all the candidates who came here to talk as well. Appreciate y'all. Thank you for joining us and thanks for making yourself so accessible. Candidate Miles, we'll turn things over to you. Okay, great, well, thank you. Uh, I guess I think what I bring to the table here for, for those uh, voters here in the 11th Congressional District is I've got a background of leadership. Uh, I was an Air Force officer, a fighter pilot, and I just retired as a federal judge. And, and I'll bring that leadership to the 11th Congressional District. Uh, second, I have vast experience in these programs. I've met thousands upon thousands of stakeholders. Uh, I work with the Social Security Administration, uh, uh, with them and with uh, outside of them for, for many years. Uh, I served in the Social Security Administ Administration Subcommittee on Capitol Hill, and then I worked uh, alongside CMS for another seven years. So I really, I think I have a deep understanding not only of the subject matter, uh, statutes, regulations, policy guidance, but also one-on-one -on -one interaction with so many people that are affected uh, by these policies and programs and the, the impact it has on the quality of their life. Uh, so I would just ask you, you know, to please trust me, uh, to vote for me, to hire me, because uh, I'll really work to represent uh, this community in Congress. And I will not stop the fight for these kids and their families uh, because uh, I really believe in them and I really believe in this. It's something that as a community, we just have to do a much better job. Uh, again, my website, uh, milesforcongress.com, that's miles with a Y for congress.com. And I would ask you to take a look at the issues because I think that's what 
this is one issue and there's many issues that uh, we all care about in, in Fairfax County and in all of our communities. And I would ask you to become informed on what these issues are and what the stances of, of people are and, and then do your civic duty and go out and vote. So uh, Twitter and Facebook on there too, of course, so always happy to have more followers. And thanks again for hosting this event and to all the candidates and in, 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 in our sitting congressmen. Uh, I thank you all uh, for the courtesies that we all shared each other and it was certainly a great experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And now we'll turn the last, last word from our candidates over to Representative Byer. Thank you very much. And thanks so much for sponsoring this. And thanks to the ARC for being part of all this. And thank you to Karina and Teddy and Jim for participating with us. Um, governing is hard. I, I wish it were just up to me, but we're one of 535 people. And so everything we do takes uh, a lot of effort, a lot of collegiality. I'm proud of the fact that I've made it through almost nine years of campaigning without saying an unkind word about any of my opponents. And I intend to do that through the rest of this campaign also. Um, but this is the most fulfilling job I've ever had because we have a chance to serve so many people. We do about 1500 individual cases a year through the Constituent Service Office, many of them for people with disabilities. I think I've explained over the last hour and a half how deeply embedded my lived experience is with people with disabilities. Uh, there is no legacy family wealth, um, but there's an awful lot of hard work over the last 50 years put back into the community, put back into the family, put back into this Northern Virginia that I love. Um, I love being a change agent and coming at this with a servant's heart because as we've often said, the way we judge the quality of our leadership, the quality of our service is what we're doing for those who have the least among us. And I will continue to do all that I can for you, for the those who have the special challenges um, as best I can for as long as I have a chance to serve. And uh, I'm pleased to be part of you tonight. And I look forward to working with you often in the days and years ahead. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I would like to turn the microphone back to Connor Cummings for some words here as we close. Thank you all for joining us. Each one of us watching can make a difference. To pass federal laws, we need these bills to pass through the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House. It must pass the majority vote. Together, we can reach out to family and friends throughout the United States, work with who is in the office for you, and help them get the votes. Together, you can educate and change other legislators' minds. It's teamwork, and it all starts with a vote. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to remind all of the folks who are attending tonight that you will be sent a link to the recording, and you can also view it immediately at the Arc of Northern Virginia's Facebook page. We wanted to give another huge thank you to the candidates and their campaign staff who worked tirelessly. Um, campaigning is no joke. <laughs> it's a thankless job in many regards. And we are so grateful for the time that you spent meeting with us in advance, working on these issues, um, speaking with families. And based upon what we're seeing in the Q&A, many continued conversations to come. We wanted to remind folks who are voting that one eight six six our vote is a free nationwide hotline if you have questions about voting at adainfo.com you can access the free mid-atlantic ada center they can answer all kinds of questions about ada accommodations including those related to voting and you're certainly always welcome to reach out to me lucy.beadnell at the arc of nova.org and i'm the person who's been sending you zoom reminders and other kinds of things so if you didn't catch my very long strange english last name um you are more than welcome to just reply to any of the messages you get from me and we're always happy to help you about policy issues or generally navigating what we heard tonight a very complex disability services world and thank you again to everybody for being with us and we look forward to hearing your stories about voting and engaging with the candidates have a lovely evening